Good evening, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to the community education session on organ and tissue donation. My name is Denis Lanou. I'm the chair of the Scarborough Hospital Community Advisory Council, and we are your host uh, this evening. The Community Advisory Council is composed of 12 uh, community members who represent the cross-section of the population served by the hospital. We, need, we meet uh, monthly and uh, provide feedback uh, to the Scarborough Hospital on behalf of the community that it serves. The Council also plays a role in community outreach, and it is in that context that we are meeting you, that we have the meeting in here tonight. Uh, tonight, uh, we will hear from five uh, presenters who will each present for approximately 10 minutes. Following the presentation, my colleague uh, Pat uh, Sherman will open the floor to the audience for, for, to ask uh, questions to members of the panel. In recognition of Be a Dollar Month, uh, celebrated throughout the month of April, we choose this evening this evening's topic to educate you on end-of-life organ and tissue donation. Currently, more than 1,500 people in Toronto are waiting for an organ transplant, and every three days, someone dies waiting for a life-saving gift. It's our hope that you will walk away this evening educated and inspired to have your name to the Provincial Organ and Tissue Donation Registry. Should you feel uh, so compelled, representative from the Scarborough Gift of Life Association will be available in the rotunda immediately following the presentation to assist you through the two-minute uh, registration process. I think some of you, including myself, uh, have already registered at the back, and uh, it's a pretty simple uh, way of doing it. So to begin our evening, I would like to invite my colleague, uh, Pat Sherman, to the podium to introduce the, the evening presenters. Uh, thanks very much, Danny. My name is Pat Sherman. I'm, uh, a member of the Community Advisory Committee associated with the Scarborough Hospital. I'd like to invite her to welcome you all this evening and uh, join me in welcoming our five very uh, accomplished speakers. Uh, on my left is Ms. Ronnie Gavsey, President and CEO of the Trillium Gift of Life uh, Network. As President and CEO of the Trillium Gift of Life Network, Ryan oversees the government agency accountable for organ issue donation and transplantation throughout Ontario. She brings business and health industry experience to her role through her work as a senior partner with KPMG, the President and CEO of the Ontario Genomics Institute, and a Managing Director of Research and Health Promotion Practice at PricewaterhouseCoopers.lp. She is a graduate of the University of Toronto's Rotten School of Management Cor Corporate Governance College. Ronnie, Fa er, Ronnie holds <coughs> excuse me, the Institute of Corporate Directors designation and a Master's of uh, Business Administration from the University of Ottawa. On Ronnie's left, uh, Tracy McCron, Organ and Tissue Donation uh, Coordinator for the Scarborough Hospital, Trillium Gift of Life Network. After 30 years of nursing, the majority of it spent in the emergency department, Tracy chose to further her professional development by enrolling in the Bachelor of Science in Nursing Programs at Rice University in 2012. Since graduating, her career has taken her to the Trillium Gift of Life Network, where she came for, where she, where she cares for families by facilitating organ and tissue donations at the Scarborough Hospital and other designated sites. As a as a proud mother of two grown children, Tracy enjoys spending her spare time lounging on the doctor and the college. To Tracy's left is Dr. Chris Rosangas, staff uh, intensivist at the Scarborough Hospital, specializing in inter internal medicine, critical care medicine, and clinical pharmacology and toxicology. Dr. Rosangas received his training from the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. In addition to his work at the Scarborough Hospital, Dr. Lazarus also acts as a consulting toxicologist for the Ontario Poison Centre at the Hospital uh, for Sick Children and, re 
represents the trillion gift of life network as a hospital donation physician where he educates others on the clinical considerations of organ and tissue, uh, tissue donation. On Dr. Uh, Lazarga's left is Ajith Varghese, Manager, Spiritual and Religious Care at the Scarborough Hospital. Since joining the Scarborough Hospital in 2008, Ajith has had the pleasure of helping patients uh, find meaning and purpose in life by drawing upon their individual religious and spiritual beliefs. He began his professional ministry as a pastoral counselor <coughs> excuse me, in the Substance Tea Addiction Clinic in 2001 before attaining his Master's of Theology in uh, Clinical Pastoral, excuse me, in Pastoral Consulting or Counseling from the University of Toronto in 2008. In addition to his role at Scarborough Hospital, he is also an adjunct faculty member in the Pastoral Department at the Toronto School of Theology. University of Toronto, certified by the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care. Ajith promotes culturally sensitive spiritual guidance to meet the diverse needs of the Scarborough community. On, on Ajith's left is Miss Helen Farina, and she is a heart transplant recipient. Helen was forced to let go of her career as a child and youth worker to focus on her health after being diagnosed with progressively worsening heart failure 12 years ago. Following months on the National Registry, her life was forever changed in April 2011 when she was provided with the opportunity for a full heart transplant. Since then, Helen has committed her life to this worthy cause by volunteering her time to the Scarborough Gift of Life Association, the Canadian Transplant Association, and many more. Last year, she was able to compete in the Canadian Transplant Games for the first time and placed in four out of her five competing categories. With that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Ms. Ronnie Gassi. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Pat. Mm -hmm. Excuse my back. <laughs> I'm honored to uh, be with you tonight, and this community has been very welcoming to Trillium Gift of Life Network. Trillium has been in, in existence since 2002, and uh, we work under a legislative act called the Trillium Gift of Life Network. Act. Under this act, we coordinate all the donation and transplant activities across the province of Ontario, partnering with many hospitals, in fact, 62 hospital corporations. What do we do? Well, not only coordinating the system, which is a very delicate, time-sensitive process, but in addition, as you will hear, uh, we approach families for consent, we match a donor to a recipient through electronic, medically uh, uh, created algorithms. We organize recovery of the organ and the transportation to the recipient at a transplant center in Ontario. We are still a relatively young organization, but we are, we believe we're on a positive trajectory. <coughs> The number of transplants is, is increasing quite dramatically, and we we are we are extremely proud to represent Ontario. I would like to provide you with some numbers about your own community. The number of people on a wait list for a life-saving organ in Scarborough: 102. 102. <coughs> medically urgent patients waiting for a life-saving transplant today. The number of transplant recipients, those people saved by the gift of life, currently living in Scarborough. If we add up over the last five years, there are 200. The number of organ donors from the Scarborough Hospital over five years, 
add up to 17. Because one organ donor can save eight lives, that becomes 289 saved lives through donors from the Scarborough Hospital. The number of tissue donors, tissues being eyes, <coughs> excuse me, bone, skin, heart valves, over five years. And keep in mind that one tissue donor can save 75 or enhance 75 lives. The number of tissue donors over five years from the Scarborough Hospital, 197. Multiply that by 75 potential enhanced lives, we're talking 14,000 people. Congratulations. And thank you. We have many partners who work with us across Ontario to uh, make this all happen. There have been studies and consultations that demonstrate that over 80% of the people in Ontario believe in organ donation. And yet, only 26% of the population has registered consent. About one quarter of the population, 26% in Ontario. What is the registration rate in Scarborough? It is 11%. The numbers that I quoted to you earlier may sound great, but the registration rate is not. We need layer upon layer of education to change this, and tonight is one of those layers, and that is why we're so appreciative that you would allow us to come. Why don't people register? That becomes the big question. People are worried that if they register, then the medical community will not work as hard to cure them, to treat them. But in fact, this is a myth. Donation and transplant are kept totally separate. It is the doctor's duty to do everything possible to cure their patients, to treat their patients. And it is only after treatment is considered no longer possible and that discussion has been had with the family that donation comes up. Trillium, gift of life, is not contacted until after this point. People need not be afraid that they will not be looked after if they register consent. Others think, I'm too old to donate. Well, age is not a factor. Let me tell you that age is not a factor. People in their 90s, in fact, over 100, have been donors. Age is not a factor. <coughs> Others will think that previous illnesses preclude them from being donors. But in fact, that is not the case. Every one of us is a potential donor and will be tested for medical suitability. Leave that up to the doctors. Consider yourself medically suitable. Leave it up to the doctors. There is no previous illness that precludes you from registering consent. Others think, how can you ask a family to donate their loved one's organs? They're in the depth of despair. It is a cruel thing to do. But let me tell you from my experience, that one of the most amazing phenomena is that donor families come into my office to say thank you. Thank you for softening our grief. <clears throat> thank you for making something positive about this trauma that we have experienced. Thank you for allowing our loved one to leave a legacy. Donor families appreciate being asked to confirm their loved one's wishes to donate. Some 
think their religion does not allow donation. To that I would say, talk to your faith leader. I think you will hear that it is not only acceptable, in many cases you will hear it is an obligation. <coughs> Lastly, some people think that donation is something that uh, is given to those who can pay for it, who can afford it, those who are well known. Well, this is just not the case. And I can tell you from being at the base, at the source where the match is made, that it is a medical algorithm that matches a donor to a recipient. Why does registration matter? When a family knows of their loved one's wishes, they almost always consent to donation. When they have no evidence of what their loved one wanted, the consent rate goes down to 50%. <clears throat> there is only one guaranteed way of making sure your family knows your wishes, and that is to register consent. To formally do it, you can go to beadonor.ca. If you have a phone, you can do it right now on your phone. It takes less than two minutes. All you need is your own hip number, and you need to be 16 years of age. If you can meet both of those, you can register consent. That is the only guaranteed way. As I mentioned today, 26% of Ontarians have registered, and only 11% of the eligible Scarborough population. There are three ways to register. You can go to beadonor.ca. You can go in person to Service Ontario. Or you can go to Service Ontario or beadonor.ca, download the form, fill it out by hand, and just mail it in. It is so easy to do. And it feels good once you've done it. So I would urge everyone to register at beadonor.ca. Today we had the privilege of joining a group of people, to, including the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care of Ontario, to announce that next year in the summer, the Canadian Transplant Games will take place here in Toronto. And we asked that no one talk to us again until they've registered consent. So we'll make the same plea here. Please register consent. I would like to now pass the uh, microphone on to my colleague, Tracy McCron, who is the Organ and Tissue Donation Coordinator at the Scarborough Hospital, the <coughs> person on the ground working for you. Thank you. opportunity to come and speak to you this evening about a topic that I am both personally and professionally absolutely passionate about. Um, I'm going to spend a bit of time, we're going to talk about my role as an organ and tissue donation coordinator and what that means, but I thought we'd first start with a bit of basics, um, talking about what a transplant is, what organ and tissue donation means, um, just to introduce some of the basics about that first. Um, actually, sorry. Um, to begin with, what is a transplant? A transplant is when we move an organ from one body in, and transplant it in, surgically into a recipient of a, a patient who has some kind of an end-stage organ disease and needs this life-threatening surgery. Um, who, needs a who needs a transplant? It's really important to remember that, um, the, like Ron said, there are 1,500 people over that on the waiting list who need who will have end-stage uh, organ failure who need to transplant, and there's 102 currently in Scarborough on that waiting list uh, that need that organ transplant. Anyone can need an organ transplant. It's regardless of age, regardless of demographics. Um, it can hit anybody. Small children are on waiting lists. Um, adults, adults are on waiting lists. Uh, so nobody is exempt from that. Um, uh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> 
one organ donor can save eight lives. And if you look at the slide in front of you, it gives you an idea of what organs can be transplanted. With organ donation, we can transplant lungs, heart, liver, pancreas, kidneys, and small bowel um, from one organ donor. So again, there's your eight lives that could be potentially saved. We also have the potential of donation for tissue donation. I think when people think of tissue donation, they automatically think of skin, which is quite understandable. But when you, when a family gets a phone call from Trillium requesting the possibility of tissue donation, they're talking about more than the skin. Skin is so important because it saves the lives of burn victims by covering and that skin and preventing infection and coming from weeping away. But it also is the gift of sight. One donor of tissue can give the gift of sight to two patients. Um, and I think you met um, a patient out front there uh, current, uh, that received eye donation years ago and has uh, certainly been very supportive of our process since then. So it's not just uh, eyes and skin, it also is heart valves. And if you think of heart valves, there are a lot of small children at the hospital for sick children right now that need those heart valves um, to continue on and lead a nice life, a uh, fulfilling life, and grow into young adults. When it comes to donation, there are two types of donors. There are living donors and there are deceased donors. When we have a deceased donor um, is when a, a loved one is near end of life or has, um, has passed away and we are approach them and ask to get consent for donation. You are hearing a lot in the news these days about living donation as well, and that's uh, when uh, someone donates a, a certain organ that is able to be transplanted from a living donor into another recipient that needs a life-saving transplant. Where do I begin to look for the organ tissue coordinator? Uh, as um, you heard, I have been a nurse for 30 years, and I've never had such an emotional, amazing, and satisfying role as a nurse until I came to Trillium. I am the person that is at the front line. We approach family members and loved ones when they have come to the point that end of life decisions have to be made. Uh, and I talk to them about the wonderful opportunity that can come and the legacy that their loved one can pass on uh, through the gift of organ donation and, and offering the gift of life to, to another recipient. We spend a lot of time together and uh, we help to make what is a tragic situation for a family. Uh, there, there's a light for them and they feel some good has happened during the situation. We spend a lot of time together. I support them. We work together through their grieving. We, we cry a lot together. We laugh a lot together. Uh, and we get through the process. This is one of my colleagues from the Scarborough Hospital, one of the charge nurses there. And it's showing you how she is making the call to the Trillium Gift of Life Network. Uh, I spend a lot of time actually educating frontline staff as well so that they know when the triggers are and when they should be calling the children to get life. Uh, she is calling into our provincial office. Uh, it's in downtown Toronto. It's open uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and she is calling in and they will screen, uh, ask her some questions about the potential donor, and then they will arrange to have a coordinator like myself come on site to meet with the families uh, and speak to them about the opportunity they have to, uh, to donate and to get consent from them. We are specially trained, and that's why it's asked that the coordinators actually come on site and approach these family members, because we have the answers to many of the questions they have and the misconceptions that Ronnie was showing you, uh, that we can help families through that decision process. We also have access to that decision when patients uh, have signed up online through Service Ontario or through beadonor.ca and we have their donation preference so we can often share that with family members because unfortunately it's not something um, family members often talk about. We certainly encourage those conversations to happen more often so that we can let them know that they did sign up um, at that time and uh, to get consent to move on through the donation process.
After uh, we get consent, uh, my role continues on. We stay on site and we support the families through the entire process. We support the team. This is um, Dr. Klaski, who is our former donation uh, physician at the Scarborough Hospital and uh, one of our colleagues as well. And I stay on site with them, um, answer the questions, work through the process, and I'm kind of the um, the go between between the family members and the staff at the hospital and the staff at the, the Trillium Gift of Life Network and the transplant teams to help coordinate the process to make sure that we have a successful donation occur. Uh, through the whole donation process, uh, we stay right with the patient, right to the point of accompanying to them to the operating room. And this is a, a, a picture of one of my colleagues in the operating room at the Scarborough Hospital as well, who uh, worked, we work together and facilitate any special requests that family members might have. Some family members um, requested uh, special music that their loved one really enjoyed be played through, through the donation process, and we will certainly arrange for that to happen. If they want special pictures to stay with the, the family member during the process, then we will do that. If they want me to stay during the whole process and then meet with the family afterwards and tell them how, how the uh, recovery went, we will certainly do that as well. <coughs> Benefits of donation. Um, certainly um, benefits to the recipients. They receive the gift of sight, um, they are able to get a heart transplant and go out and enjoy the activities of life and be with their loved ones. Um, those are the obvious benefits of donation. But the benefits to the family are absolutely huge as well. And as Ronnie mentioned, uh, we hear often from family members. They will give us a phone call, uh, they'll drop into the office uh, just to tell us how grateful they feel and how the, the decision process was difficult at the time, but after everything was said and done, um, they feel very proud that their loved one has been a hero and has lived on through that legacy that they've given. And as one of our donors has said, as hard as it was to lose our son, the decision to donate was easy. He saved lives and in essence continues to live on. We were and are proud of what he and we were able to do. Thank you. I'd like to pass it on to my co-worker, Dr. Crystal Zongis, who we work together at the Scarborough Hospital through the donation process. So, uh, thanks, Tracy. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of the, the medical processes and the medical considerations of the donation. Uh, but before that, a little bit about my role as a hospital donation physician, which is really to promote organ and tissue donation at the hospital level through education of the physicians and nurses, as well as policy development and implementation uh, at the hospital to really ensure that patients and families that are interested in, in donating their organs and tissues have the opportunity to do so. Uh, we also communicate and collaborate with other physicians in the Trillium Gates of Life Network to ensure that you know, the best medical practices are followed in supporting uh, physicians that have questions about uh, the medical management of potential uh, donors. The most important is really to foster a culture that's supportive uh, within the medical staff in the hospital, uh, that, that, that's supportive of providing this opportunity for donation, because I think it's very important for, uh, for the families, and we'll hear a bit more about that later, uh, it helps give them a sense of uh, closure and a sense of a positive outcome coming out of a very tragic situation. So uh, we, medically we have three areas of focus. Uh, one is the uh, donation after neurologic death and uh, more recently we also have donation after cardiac death. And in addition, uh, there's, uh, there are medical considerations around organ donor management. So donation after neurologic death or brain death is the historically been the usual pathway to organ donation. This happens uh, in the case of a, a catastrophic brain injury uh, that causes a complete and irreversible damage to the brain. So patients no longer have the ability to re regain consciousness uh, or, or even have some of the brainstem reflexes that maintain uh, their life. For the purpose
purposes of donation, we have to have two physicians to confirm the diagnosis of neurological death because you know, we certainly don't want to make any, any mistakes around this process. And, and after donation, uh, if, if, uh, after diagnosis of neurological death, rather, if the family consents to donation, uh, the donor continues to receive organ support in, in preparation for donation. So the, the usual conditions where neurological death can occur are things like like prolonged cardiac arrest where the heart is not beating, not sending enough blood and oxygen to the brain, or severe head trauma, uh, or, or a massive bleeding into the brain. And uh, commonly this, this actually happens in, in often young patients that really exacerbates the tragedy to, to, to their families. More recently, the, the pathway of donation after cardiac death has been developed, and that's been available in Ontario since 2006. Interestingly, it was actually developed in response to a family's request for donation in, in a patient who did not meet the usual criteria for neurologic death. But the family was, was so passionate about providing the opportunity for their loved ones' organs to be donated that uh, they, they helped put pressure on the medical staff and, and ultimately led to, uh, led to the donation of that patient's organs. And, uh, this is very important because it, it provides the potential for more individuals to donate their organ, even if they wouldn't have been able to donate under the, the older, more established pathway. So again, similar to donation after neurologic death, after this decision is made by the family to, to withdraw life-sustaining therapy, um, they're then approached for consent and or, or arrangements are made for donation after withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy. So depending on which pathway the patient falls under, whether it's neurologic death or cardiac death, uh, the, either once neurologic death is declared or the family has decided to withdraw life-sustaining therapy, a coordinator like Tracy will approach the family to discuss the possibility of organ donation. And if the family consents, then we continue treatment of the, of the patient to support uh, organ function and donation. And the kind of treatments that we continue are essentially the same treatments that we, we were using beforehand to keep, to keep the patient alive uh, until um, the patient's ultimate outcome became clear. So uh, we, some specific activities that we've been undertaking at the Scarborough Hospital uh, to encourage organ donation uh, have been educational sessions for the physicians and nurses around how to diagnose neurological death, what is the actual process of donation after cardiac death, because as I mentioned, it's a fairly new process. And then some of the specifics around organ donor management, as well as when to initiate the referral to the Children Get the Life Network to ensure that families that are interested have access to donation. But just as important as these medical policies is the education of the staff, in particular around common questions and concerns that are raised by the families, Things such as religious views, funeral arrangements, financial concerns, and things like that. So, just some key points that I, that I want to emphasize: uh, you know, ensuring access to donation really leads to family satisfaction. It, uh, families that consent to donation are often very passionate advocates for this process, and they report that it, you know, it helps them with reading the face of these tragic circumstances. So, we try to support them as much as possible. Because we think it's, it's good medicine and it's a compassionate thing to do for families that have experienced such tragedy. Also, we take great care to ensure that there aren't any conflicts of interest. Uh, so our medical team is not involved in the transplantation side of things, uh, just the donation side. And we, we, we ensure that the decisions around withdrawal of the sustaining therapy are independent from and, and most importantly that they precede the decision to donate uh, one's organs. Uh, and we proceed only with explicit consent from the families. And this is very important. It ensures that you know, we aren't soliciting donors for specific recipients. And our focus as the medical staff is, is really on the patient in front of us. We do everything that we can to, to keep that keep that patient alive and try to help them recover. And only when it becomes clear that that's not going to be possible do we do we even approach the families for donation. And, and like I said, it's really in the face of these tragic cases that 
we're, we're trying to provide the opportunity for something positive to come with them. Um, and it's almost invariably families that do go on to donate come back and thank us for, uh, for our help with getting through the grieving process. So I'm, I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker, uh, G. Curtis, uh, to talk a little bit about spiritual and religious aspects. story all the time. So I'm going to tell you a story. It was a Saturday afternoon, it's a rainy sa Saturday afternoon, and a patient came to the emergency. Let's call her April. April had an accident and uh, she was not going to make it. So the family gathered around and uh, somehow the decision, the discussion of organ and tissue donation came into their midst. But one of the family members immediately raised a question well, we can do that. And another family member asked, why is that? And I was present in a conversation, and uh, one of them said, in our religion, it is very important to have all the body parts intact when we die. Only then, we will be going to heaven. And it was a very significant belief. But we were able to resolve or find solution for that belief or find ample information for that belief within a short period of time. So I want you... Uh, uh, let you know that when people are ill or dying, culture and traditions and religion become or regain very big importance at that time. And religious beliefs and practices. People ask in, in the story of uh, April, as I said, what does my religion say about this? Or is there anything I can do according to our religion? And then they talk about spiritual beliefs and meaningfulness. What does this is mean to me? How is my life shifting now? Or how can I make my life most meaningful when I cannot be happy anymore? And then they also talk about cultural values and norms. They consider cultural values and norms. If they are making a donation, they will ask, what would others think of me? Or would it bring pride or shame to my me or my clan or my family? Or what are the usual practices in my culture? People who consider these. So the dying process, withdrawal of uh, sustaining, life-sustaining therapy and organ and tissue donation needs to be addressed with sensitivity. And we provide, spiritual and religious care, uh, provide three-step uh, support during this time. And the first one is called decision-making. Exploring the desire behind the consideration. Why do you want to do this? And we work very um, well with Tracy on this, if anybody expresses their wish to have the organ donation or tissue donation, we immediately contact Tracy, so we work very closely in this. Um, exploring the decide behind the consideration, why do you want to do this? So one of the family members said, a young mother who was losing her husband, she said, I want my children to be happy about their dad when they grow up. So there is a reason behind it. And another person said, She's, she always liked to help others, so her soul would be happy if we do this. And we also do clarify doubts, clarifying doubts and answering questions with related to spiritual and religious beliefs. So for example, one person asked us, so if I donate one of my body parts, or, or if I agree to donate the body part of my loved one, will it be accepted in heaven without that body part? And another person asked, uh, how would it affect my cycle of birth? Should I need to have all my body parts in that to have another birth? So there are different uh, beliefs and religious practices and cultural values that impact their decision making and that creates doubt. And most of the time as spiritual care providers working in a healthcare setting, we may not have the complete answers or right answers. So what we do is we connect the community uh, resources. And we also provide literature which is available to Trillium. We have some literature we provide to the families uh, at that time. And the second step is 
uh, during the procedure, sometimes when a uh, loved one is undergoing the procedure of organ uh, donation or in that procedure, we create rituals if requested by the patient or family. Sometimes, as Tracy mentioned, having a specific music or creating a, a, a specific spa a space for them to share the memories of their loved one. And in one of such discussions, one family member said, as I mentioned about, uh, I mentioned earlier, that she always liked to help people. So having this donation would make her soul really happy, and she will continue to live on among us. And we also provide sustaining persons, as Tracy mentioned. Tracy is one of them that provides uh, sustaining persons and spiritual and religious care providers. As spiritual and religious care providers. Some families request for our continuous persons, and we provide them at that time. And um, our uh, another uh, support is post-procedure therapies. So grief counseling or emotional support to the donor or family members, uh, whether the family is uh, whether the uh, donor is alive or deceased. Sometimes the family members or the donor itself needs uh, continuing support. Uh, grief counseling, we provide that. And support for the recipient with the transition to new meaning-making process. So immediately the recipients find that, ah, this is uh, a new life for me. I have a new lease on my life. So how do I want to live this? And they became very grateful in their life. They want to take their life in a new direction, want to help people, want to live in that reverence of the new reverence they have towards their life. So we support them in the transition to that new meaning-making process. And we also continue with the spiritually integrated therapies that we usually provide at that time, both for donors, for donor's family, and for the recipient and recipient's families. And we also help them to connect with community resources if desires. So sometimes, because of the uh, limitation of the hospital, we will not be able to provide a continuous support once uh, they are discharged from the hospital. At that time, after receiving permission from them, we usually connect them to the community services we provide referrals to them. And in conclusion, I want to say that when faced with the decision of organ and tissue donation uh, during the trauma of a loved one's death, a person's religion or spiritual belief suddenly becomes very important. And as the decision is being made, the question arises, what is my religion stands on organ and tissue donation? And most of us are not aware of our own religious group's doctrine and position regarding the organ and tissue donation. So as a result, the decision maker often looks for a faith leader or a hospital spiritual care provider for, or for an informed answer. And in Scarborough Hospital, as always, we are committed to provide an outstanding care that meets, every, uh, that meets the unique needs of our patients. So thank you very much. Uneventful. 
However, sometime after midnight, it became extremely difficult to breathe. I couldn't find a comfortable position in which I could breathe, except for getting down on my elbows and knees. As the evening progressed, I realized that something was seriously wrong. At about 2 a.m., I called Telehealth Ontario. After answering just a few questions, I was told that I had a medical emergency and they were sending an ambulance for me. My immediate response was, no, I cannot leave. I'm alone here with eight kids. They insisted that they were sending an ambulance for me. I had, in the meantime, managed to reach the on-call manager, who arrived still wearing her pajamas when we were greeting me out the door. A policeman did show up just in case I had no relief. I was rushed to the Scarborough Grace Hospital, where after undergoing a number of tests in the ER, I was informed that I had a heart attack. You can just imagine my surprise, because up until that time, I didn't even know that there was a problem with my heart. I then learned that the symptoms for women are usually different from those of men. And the pressure and the pain that I was feeling in my back between my shoulder blades were definite symptoms. After a week of more tests and being stabilized, I was informed that I had congestive heart failure. My heart was enlarged with less than 40% function. I was then sent home with a regimen of medications. But less than a year later, I was back in the hospital with the same symptoms. After another week of treatment, when I was being stable, I went home with a few adjustments in my medications. For the next few years, my heart failure became progressively worse. I was in and out of the hospital every five to six months. It became like a duct tape solution. Hospital, treatment, home, until the next time, and then the same thing all over again. In 2009, my cardiologist at the time, who had been treating me for a little over six years, advised there was not much else he could do for me. He then referred me to a heart failure specialist at St. Mike's Hospital, who promised to get to the bottom of the problem, but he also warned that at the end of it all, he may have to tell me there was nothing else he could do for me. By this time, I was being hospitalized every two months. My heart was now functioning 20 to 25 percent. I had started out with one leaking valve, now everything was leaking. It was difficult for me to walk more than 10 steps without stopping and gasping for air. Most days were spent feeling much like a rag doll. No energy, fatigue, and exhaustion 24-7. My complexion was gray and my lips were always blue. Things that I took for granted now required so much effort. Stairs were an absolute nightmare. At least four nights a week, I slept in a recliner in my living room because I didn't have the energy to climb the stairs. And I, I, the couch was not an option because laying down, unless I had about five or six pillows, I couldn't lie down. I needed help showering, getting dressed, I eventually cut my hair really short because it was so difficult to lift my arm to comb my hair or even to reach for items in the upper shelves of cabinets. Couldn't do simple things like grocery shopping without someone to carry my bags. In fact, I didn't leave the house unless accompanied by someone else. In case, in case I had an emergency, of course. I went from being the person that everyone depended on to the person who needed help from everyone. My mother had recently passed, and being the eldest sibling in a family of 14, yes, 14, I had automatically assumed the role as matriarch of the family. However, instead of solving everyone's problems, I had serious problems of my own. My siblings were so very worried because they couldn't bear the thought of losing another family member so soon after my mom's passing. Transplants don't just affect recipients, it affects entire families. 
After a year of more testing, med changes, and a number of investigative procedures, this new cardiologist informed me there was nothing he could do for me. And my only option was to transplant. I was then referred to the transplant team at Toronto General, where I had to undergo further testing and screening to determine whether I even qualified as a candidate for transplant. If I was too sick or not sick enough, I would not be considered. Eventually, in November of 2010, on the day before my birthday, I received a telephone call with the news that I was now listed. I could not believe it. I asked the person who called to repeat it. Finally, it seemed there was a tiny flicker at the end of that very long, dark tunnel. Then came the anxiety of waiting. I was given a pager which I had to carry with me everywhere. And I was also told that I had to remain within a two hour radius of the hospital at all times. From that day on, every time the phone rang, I almost jumped out of my skin, wondering, is this it? Is this a call? By January 2011, I was being hospitalized at least once a month. Meanwhile, my kidneys were beginning to fail. They were functioning below 30%. And it was thought that I may eventually be kidney transplant also. On meeting with the nephrologist, I was informed that sometimes heart failure can cause kidney failure and that he would review the situation after my transplant. Because kidney function usually, in most cases sometimes, would improve post-transplant. Meanwhile, my heart failure had gone from acute to end stage, and I was now being considered for an artificial heart, or LVAD, which is a left ventricular assistive device, which becomes necessary when the heart is no longer capable of supplying other organs with, uh, in the body with the necessary volume of oxygen-rich blood to maintain proper function. It is usually just a bridge until a donor heart becomes available. Two weeks after meeting with the director of surgery to discuss the LVAD, at 8.41 one morning, I got the call I was waiting for. I was told that I found a heart for me and that I should get to the hospital as soon as possible. I arrived at the hospital before the heart did. Now my life is so different. It keeps getting better every day. I can now go for long walks. I completed three 5K walks last year. And I will be doing another one on this weekend. I can go up the three flights of stairs in my home without a problem. I can ride a bicycle again, I can dance, which I had not done in about six years. I can even fly again, something I wasn't allowed to do for about eight years. In July of last year, I traveled to Mountain New Brunswick to participate in the Canadian Transplant Games, where I earned four medals, gold in women's 5K cycling, another gold in the 100 meter dash, a silver in the 3K walk race, and a bronze in shot. There was a period prior to my transplant when I would not make any long-term plans. However, shortly after my transplant, while still in the hospital for my bed in the ICU, I voted in a federal election for the first time in about a decade. Before that, I thought, what's the point? But after receiving my gift, I realized that now I had a future to look forward to, and I needed to have a say who was going to make decisions about that future. This gift has made the difference between just barely existing under a cloud of uncertainty and living, real living. In fact, I would say I'm thriving. I look back with so much gratitude and look forward with so much hope. Possibilities are endless. After the transplant, the surgeon spoke with my family. He told them everything had gone well, but he also mentioned that the heart they removed was four times the size of the one that I had been living, and that I was living on borrowed time. 
I was lucky to have made it that far. Those numbers you see up on the screen represent time. No longer borrowed time, but extra time that I've been given. Time I would not have had if not for my transplant. Time with my family and friends. Time to just live. I have celebrated three new additions to my family, engagements, graduations, and I'm looking forward to a special wedding at the end of the summer. Each new day is a blessing. And I've had 1,473 new days. 32,352 hours, 2,121,120 minutes, and approximately, approximately 170 million perfect heartbeats. And this was all made possible because someone, a perfect stranger, took the time to register as a donor. I will be eternally grateful to my donor and that courageous family for their generosity. In their darkest moment of grief, they took the time to give their consent to donate their loved one's organs. There's always that feeling of guilt that someone had to die in order for me to live. <coughs> There's not a day that goes by that I don't think of them and their generosity. And I pray that they have found some comfort in the knowledge that their loved one's heart lives on in my body. Even though we may never ever meet, this legacy will always be a bond between us. I've promised them that I will take the best care possible of this wonderful, precious gift, and that I will always strive to be a generous and caring person as their loved one was. I do sometimes get emotional when I'm speaking about my donor. My donor is a partner in everything I do and accomplish. I have given my heart to me. In honor of my donor, I have made my new heart hero. This gift saved my life. And I now refer to that date as my second birthday. I am one of the fortunate few who has two birthdays each year, one in the spring and another one in the fall. I refer to this experience as five Gs. The gift that gave me a second chance, least in life, my gratitude, for which there are no words to adequately describe. The guilt, which will never go away. Giving back. Organ donation awareness is now my passion. And last, but definitely not least, God, with his guiding hand, coordinated every aspect of this amazing, miraculous journey that is now my life. My way of giving back is to donate as much of this extra time that I've been given towards raising awareness for the dire need for registered organ and tissue donors. My bottom line is and always will be those approximately 1,500 people on the waiting list. <coughs> I hope to help turn their time on the waiting list into extra time. That is the reason why I'm so passionate about this. I cannot say this often enough. One donor could save up to eight lives and enhance the lives of up to 75 others. I will repeat some of the numbers you heard early. earlier. Scarborough's registration rate currently sits at 11%. The provincial average is just about 26%. This means that only one out of every nine eligible residents in Scarborough registered as donors. As of yesterday, out of 1,589 Ontarios, there were 102 Scarborough residents on the waiting list. Every 72 hours, someone here in Ontario dies because a much needed organ was not available. I'm one of the founding members of Scarborough Gift Life Association, a volunteer group consisting of recipients donor family members, and very dedicated supporters. You may have seen some of our colleagues, some of our members, at the organ donation information booth as you came 
if you have not already done so, please stop by before leaving. We'll be happy to share information with you. Scarborough needs your help. We need your help. There's so many ways which you can help. We're always seeking volunteers. My colleagues will be happy to take your contact information. If you belong to a church or organization, invite us to come and speak with your members. If you're a school teacher, Trading Gift of Life has an excellent high school outreach program. Just give them a call. If you're an employer or an employee, Trading Gift of Life can provide you with the tools for hosting a workplace registration drive. If you're an elected official, include us in your events. We would welcome the opportunity to participate and share our message. To transplant recipients and their families, all donors are heroes. And to the 1,500 plus Ontarians desperately waiting, waiting for life-saving organs, every registered donor is a hero. I urge you, please give serious consideration to registering your consent to become organ donors. It is the most generous thing anyone can do for another human being. It's so easy. Just visit the beadonor.ca website, enter your health card number, along with your date of birth, and it takes two minutes. And just as important, please do discuss with your families. Let them know that these are your wishes. I'll leave you with this challenge. If each person here passes this message on to just five other people and asks those individuals to do the same, and so on. By the third time around, this message would have reached thousands. Could you imagine the impact? Thank you so much for this opportunity to share my story with you today. And remember, it takes only two minutes to become a hero. Just by going to the website, beadonor.ca, it's been a privilege to share my story with you. Thank you.